All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Jocelyn Warren. I'm an assistant research professor in the college for a few more hours. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to introduce Matthew Francis, Dr. Matthew Francis. He just defended his dissertation on the synergistic relationship between HIV and gonorrhea among HIV positive men in Michigan. So that was at Michigan State University. With Lane County in a special fellowship called the Health Systems Integration Program Fellowship that is sponsored by the CDC and the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists and the Public Health Informatics Institute, among others. And he'll be with us um, through, um, right now it's through August of 2015, so it's a one year fellowship. We're hoping to extend it, but we're not sure yet. And his official title is Community Health Epidemiologist with Lane County. So he's here to talk to us about the work he's been doing in that role. Thank you, um, So the main work I've been doing is integrating public health systems. Um, so the presentation is integration-based public health, a paradigm shift <coughs> towards better population-based data. And that's really what the fellowship was intended to be and what we're aiming for. So a little bit of background. Uh, we're going to go through health systems integration, why we need integration, the current state of integration, um, and then examples of integration-based public health. And those examples are quitting tobacco in pregnancy, so a maternal smoking cessation study, uh, the 5 A's tobacco cessation, so using a tool, um, trying to get EHRs to comply with it and make sure it's being documented, uh, STD reduction coalition, immunization registry compliance, and a small project on lethal means prevention. Um, and the conclusion is going to be where we need to be. So for, I wish this would have turned out a little bit better, um, for informatics, there's this idea of the pathway of observation, data, information, knowledge, action, and wisdom. Does that help? Uh, I think so, a little bit. Um, when we apply it to public health, though, we really need to add in how public health fits into these things. And really, one of the best ways is public health fits in the beginning. It really is great at observing things and recording the data and getting numbers. So seeing where there might be a problem and then getting databases and things together. Um, where we stumble is, once we know what we need, how do we get these things? Um, and that's really what this fellowship was intended to be, is if a program needs vital records, how do you go about getting those and how do you link them together? Academia does it really well with grants, but there's no existing structure past the grant. Um, so the grant happens, we link things together, then all of a sudden that whole linkage is forgotten until it's needed again. Um, so this integration project was to develop a framework that says, okay, if companies need, not companies, if health systems need uh, vital records, how can we develop a structure that gives them vital records and it will be there when they need it the next time and not have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, so the main takeaways is how does integration lead to better population data, which is the main focus. And then because in academia, you're one of the places that we want to integrate with and we want to be a part of and we want to work with you on grants is what can public health, what does public health have access to and what are we missing and what can essentially through integration we gain by integrating health systems, integrating nonprofits and things like that. So broad overview of the CDC definition of public health informatics. It's not great. No one really defines informatics and in really what can consider a meaningful way. I consider it the science of data. So what do you do with data once you have it? Can you analyze if there's missing data? Um, do you know where that missing data is and can you get it someplace else? CDC's um, official thing is public health informatics is a science that supports the effective use of information and information technology to improve public health practice and outcomes. It's very vague and, vague and it's vague for a reason. It's we're still defining how we fit into this program. Um, so we have public health, uh, informatics, and then really is how do these two entities mash up to your project and read it as your project, your grant, um, your goal for when you graduate or move on with your career. So what is a health system? So a health system is an organization of people, institutions, and resources that deliver health care services to meet the needs of the target population. Um, this can be anything from hospitals to clinics to schools. Um, everyone in this room is essentially part of a health system. Uh, universities have great health systems, clinics like that. There's also MPOs, so things like HIV Alliance, who mainly does needle exchange, but they also help individuals with HIV. So, so it's, are they 
are they health care services? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, and so that's a great point. So even if your public health organization doesn't actually have a health care entity in it, the fact that they're looking at a population and trying to make changes to it to improve health um, is one of those things. Um, CDC doesn't really do health care, um, but they are a key player in the health system. They allow for surveillance systems and really the collection of data. Um, they kind of become the central repository for a lot of individuals of where does data get reported to and how do you then report, you know, if someone has next gen and all these other things, the total number of gonorrhea in a county and then extrapolate to a state and other things and get these numbers. Um, so it does go past just actual what we consider a healthcare setting to be. So integration. It's more than just a handshake. You really have to meet the other person halfway, um, and really more than halfway. Um, when we look at it, it's from our standpoint, it's creating this infrastructure that's going to last. So if we know an entity needs our program, sometimes they don't know that they need it. Um, so right now I'm working with a local CCO. They have a problem matching moms to babies, and they're trying to do it through claims data. And these moms come on, they give birth, and then they drop off of their Medicaid claims data. Well, the baby comes on shortly after, and there's no way to actually merge these two individuals. Sometimes the addresses are different. Sometimes the last names are different. Um, sometimes we don't really know even what the best birthdays are. Um, so what we can do is say, OK, we have the system at the county called Vital Records that has birth certificates. And yes, birth certificates change. People change the baby's names and things like that. But it's a way to look up the mom and say, who is this baby attached to? Um, and so we're trying to create a structure and going through all the data hoops and things like that of um, how do you get this in place and then can you use it for death registries? So a lot of health plans would like to know when their people actually died. So it's really hard to say this is the end cost for diabetics if you don't know when they actually died. You know when their claims stopped, but that doesn't mean that they didn't go into different insurances, they moved away and things like that. Um, so these kinds of things are one place has them, the other place knows this is what they need, but they actually don't know who they should be talking to or what actually exists. Um, so there's things like the National Death Index, which is very difficult to use, and it's not that great. Um, and it costs money. So if the county can then take their vital records and make money off the CCO, that might be the best resource for them. And it's county-based, too, so it's going to be a lot quicker. Um, the other part is there needs to be a continuous relationship. So this is how kind of integration kind of differs from your traditional grant. Your grant is, during the grant, Everyone works together, you request data, you're talking, things like that. When that grant stops, those relationships tend not to continue on, um, which for perfect reasons. There's really no need for those relationships to continue on other than for other grants. What integration is, is these relationships need to stay. So when we know that there's a linkage issue, that one person has to go through, jump through all these hurdles, figure it out, that that information isn't lost, that we can say, this needs to stay, these are the hurdles, and let's overcome them with a different system so that when the next people come and have the same request, we're not stuck standing and doing the same thing that we did a long time ago, and no one knows who did it because that person moved on. Um, the other part is ability to assess gaps and build via mutual resources. So working in public health, we're good at a lot of things. Finding funding isn't something we're good at. Um, but if we can help other people with data and get funding through that, that's something that we need to move forward with as well. Um, so integration kind of takes on these other roles of it's not just data systems. Um, it's more than that. It's resources. It's having people in academia who are part of public health and having people in public health who sit on boards of directors for the CCO or for hospitals and things like that so that people can make better informed decisions of how to essentially deal with populations. So how does it start? There's a need to form trust. And right now, being in public health, that's our biggest hurdle to overcome with anyone. Um, whether it's the public, whether it's a company, is we're seen as we report to the government. We are the government, so people tend not to trust us. They tend to ask us for data, but when it comes to us asking them for data so that we could do GIS analysis or things like that, they get really hesitant because that's their data. Um, there's a lot of, this is mine, I need yours, I don't want to share mine. And so that comes into the building the bridges between community leaders. So having people sit on boards and things like that, just cross integration of your probably academia, but you're also in public health, so that when these things come up, people know that you're not really a neutral party, but you're a voice that they know they can trust. And they can go to you and say, what's going to happen with this data? 
what's the process for after the data is being used? How long does it sit there before it's destroyed? What are the de-identification steps, things like that? These are really important when you get into IRBs and everything else because people want to know, yes, you're going to use the data, that's great. It should be for public health use and improving public health, but what happens afterwards? What happens to that data and then who owns that data too becomes an issue. So who do you approach? The easy answer is the people who have the resources you need. Um, the hard answer that really takes some time looking into is who can you help with and what data can you give to other people? Because a lot of people sit on these data silos that they know they exist, but no one else knows they exist. And when you start actually reaching across the table and saying, we're public health, this is what we're aiming to do, you find that a lot of people have these data warehouses that just sit there and they have a diabetic silo. And we have a food desert silo of saying, this is where the food desert exists in the neighborhood. And we can actually, when you map it out, it turns out that the, di or the diabetics and the obese patients tend to fall within these um, food deserts or where there's large populations of fast food restaurants. Now, a big hospital system doesn't have time to do that analysis. Public health does look into that. It does look into where are the resources, where are the fast food, where's the easy access to junk food. Um, then there's always the issue of what does public health traditionally miss. We've always missed clinical data. So we can tell you the number of gonorrhea in a county at any given time. We can run a report. We can't tell you how many of those people came in for routine screening, how many of those people had a pretty severe infection. So what we're doing is we're taking all this data, we have the count, and we're saying we have an STD problem in Lane County. But we don't know how severe it is. Are all these people coming in symptomatic? Are all these people just being picked up because it's routine screening? These are important issues. And when you start looking at treatment failure, it's even more important. So how many asymptomatic patients are failing to treatment? Usually pretty low. But if you have a high load of people who are symptomatic and have verging on systemic infections, treatment might not work best. And so you're making this blanket statement without actually knowing the clinical information. So at the end of the day, why integrate? So every health system has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, and the really good health systems knows where their gaps are and where their weaknesses are. Um, and the best example I've come to find is a lot of people outside of public health who work in the field feel that disease is the agent and the host. So you get this disease, and that's, that's what it amounts to. Um, but we all know it's far more complicated. So you have this traditional epi pyramid of the agent, HIV, the environment, so in Michigan, and the host, humans. But there's this actual synergistic relationship of gonorrhea affects the same human population in the same environment. So how do you reconcile that? And when you get into chronic diseases, it's far more complicated than that. So how does diabetics, it's not just you have a diabetic, his name is Matt. Well, where does Matt live? What does Matt have access to? Where did Matt grow up? Things like that are very important. What's his health history? You know, could we have prevented this diabetes before? These are important issues, and integration tries to aim at. <coughs> we know this piece of the puzzle. You know this piece of the puzzle. Let's merge them together and actually create a better public health system. The current state of integration. This was a very sobering slide for me to make. I thought this was going to be the easiest slide in my presentation. What's the current state? We don't know. Integration really is so new and it varies by state. So there's the good side of it. So healthcare or health systems are focused on preventing diseases now. There's not a lot of health systems that are still stuck in the, well, we don't want people to go to end stage renal disease, but if they're diabetic, we can make a tidy profit on them as long as they don't pass into this end stage renal disease. And more and more health systems are realizing that they actually need help in preventing diabetes. They're really good at preventing end-stage renal disease, but how do you prevent the diabetics from becoming diabetics? Um, so academic research institutions have been doing this for years. They've been integrating, they've been going across the aisle and saying, this is what we offer. We offer advanced stat stats, we offer advanced methodologies. You have this data, let us show you what your population actually looks like. And public health has been doing it for a little bit longer, but we don't communicate with each other. We communicate when it's convenient for one party to reach out to the other party but there is no existing bridge that lasts. So what the bad part is? Nothing makes lasting change. So people have these great projects, they work. Um, we find that you know, seizures cause X disease, but then what do we do with it? We worked with public health to get these records, to get the seizure records, to get the birth records, to get all these records, but we found out what might be a factor, what do we do with it then? 
Is that in public health court? Is that in the academic research court? Is that in the health systems court? So who's taking on this goal? And we find that a lot of times it gets dropped. It gets dropped to look at the next stage of the risk factor as opposed to what can we do to prevent this disease knowing what we know now while someone else comes in and does more research. And we find that hurdles are often repeated. Um, the best example is birth records. So linking mom and baby shouldn't be as hard as it is. Um, when you look at the surface, it should be a pretty easy thing. When you look in the data, it is not an easy thing. It's very complex and no one seems to have a great system, but it always gets done. And it gets done in different ways and you have different methodologies that either work quickly or they drag on. Then there's the issue of the cost of the data. So not just what does it cost to get the data, but people start to realize that their data is very important. And it becomes, well, I have all this data, you have 10% of that data, so my data is far more important, when really it's not. It's we need to get the whole picture and people need to start seeing that just because you own 90% of the data, that 10% is actually privately important and they're affecting your 90% because they live in the same neighborhoods. They go to the same hospital. Yeah, they might not go to your hospital every time, but they're across the street, so you have them in both systems. What are they seeing that you're not because you know, the health information exchanges have become, have started to fall off. So then, um, oh. I, I guess I need to clarify, I want clarification. Okay. Is it okay to interrupt yeah, you? Yeah, okay. definitely. So I want to understand health systems, mm -hmm. academic research, and public health. Okay. You, is, is public health governmental, public health? Is it doesn't have to be. Okay. Um, so in most of my examples, yes, because that's the, the background I come from. Okay. But Public health does reach into research, but not all the time. Um, okay. And really, public health in most of these, most of these examples is the um, implementation of public health. So not really doing the research side of it and looking into causes, but actually, what do we know? So we know that tattoo shops, you need to screen them for hepatitis. Um, and they need to be using needles, clean needles. Um, that was research that was done, not by public health, but it's now public health's purview to make sure that tattoo shops are compliant with these things. Is that Yeah, and then, then there's health systems. Mm -hmm. So health systems the, is the overarching one. So research fits into it as long as it's health focused and you're essentially looking at health um, outcomes in a population, public health fits into it. Um, but health systems are focused on preventing diseases. So right. are all health systems focused on preventing I, I think I think they really are now. Um, I think there's very few, so even looking at like most people don't consider a county jail to be a health system, um, but they really are. So in Ohio recently, a couple months back, they found a case of leprosy within their jail. They've been treating it as MRSA because it's a jail population. It should be MRSA, and it was actually leprosy. So by finding it, reporting it, and everything, they are actually a health system. Um, so it really is trying to improve the population health, and sometimes it's not seen that way. But I think most places that at any level of outreach towards that way do improve it, whether it's research or not. Thank you. Um, so the final part is this whole thing of what's a handout versus what's collaboration? What's a project versus what's a study? And at the end of the day, what's a grant versus what's actually integration? Um, and it comes down to the scope and what's going to remain. So a grant, not a lot of things remain. Um, they're mainly in studies, so it's hard to change your study. Everyone that's went through and done CDC and had to go through OMB knows that to change a word takes about five months. In a program that public health at Lane County did, we changed the whole program, down from the screening tool to the name of it in a snap, because we had to. It was a great program and it was failing. And instead of having to sit through the bureaucracy of, okay, to make sure that we have this data and we can push it out to a paper, we need to take these precautions of, when we switch to a different database, can we keep the data? We said, well, that's great. We're not going to be able to publish on any of this because it's just not going to happen at this point. But this program needs to be successful. So we took the whole program, rehauled it, and the first year is what it is. And we can't really compare it to the second year because everything changed. But it needed to happen because it was an important program. Um, and that's really the big difference between a study where it could be going poorly and you're going to salvage whatever you can on that study and work in the limits of how you can change it versus some of the public health programs that we get funding and we have to make this program work. Um, people invested in it and they need an outcome. So what is integration-based public health? Again, 
building lasting relationships within the community. That's the biggest part. Um, it's really trying to get people to talk with one another um, on a constant basis. And what is public health good at? So these five are the five rubrics of epidemiology, which kind of, I think, summarize kind of nicely what public health is good at. So public health has a public health department, uh, which is we know how many people are sick. We know what increases risk based on the research that we can look up and do. Um, and we really know the prevention and treatment side of it. What we don't know is for diseases of unknown causes, we don't do anything that really shows what it causes. Um, we take existing data and say, okay, we know that you know, condom usage and SDs are correlated. So let's do that study and let's do a program based on getting condoms out to see if we can reduce the numbers. What we don't do is say, let's look at comorbidities and co-infections and let's do a whole study based on the longitudinal analysis of you get chlamydia, how long do you, till you get another disease or get co-infected and things like that. Um, and then the mechanisms. So we don't look at how HIV really attacks a cell in public health. Um, in public health being the Department of Public Health. We just don't have the resources to focus on that. But that's an important part in preventing HIV. And so we need to work with individuals who say, this is how it works in the cell, this is how it works for the infection, and this is how you can then go about treating it and preventing it. And a great example of that is in Ebola. And it's everywhere now, so it's one of the best examples of virologists for the longest time have been saying, fruit bats are the reservoir. Um, microbiologists have been saying their saliva carries Ebola in it, and when they eat fruit, it can be there and it can become infected. Um, vets and ecologists have been saying that after the rainy season, fruit bats fly through this certain path to eat the fruit that's been collected. And epidemiologists have been saying, well, after a rainstorm, we see that there's usually an outbreak in the Sudan somewhere. Um, it's usually pretty mild, and it's usually linked back to some kind of food basis. No one was looking at the whole picture and all these other disciplines and saying, well, these fruit bats flew through this area that had this infection during this time. What's the common factor? And that really wasn't being done. Um, epidemiologists were saying, well, it could be apes. But when you look at the vet side and the immunology side of it, apes were dying off to Ebola for a long time. There's very few that have any kind of natural antibodies to the disease. So they can't be the reservoir. So it was really this looking at what everyone had and integrating it. And with this outbreak, I think it finally came to the head of, we can't ignore this anymore. We have to look at all the data that's available. So what was the temperature like? What were the migratory patterns of apes and bats and everything else? And how do you start then to pinpoint and say, this is where we have to go. And after these kinds of events, this is where we should go to look for reservoirs. Um, we're also pretty poor at securing funding at the departments. Um, we apply for grants, but our grants are very different. They're very much a program grant of, we want to do this on a population. We want to count all the tobacco outlets. We want to put in this many condoms and this many clinics in this amount of time. And it's not really these structural grants of, this is a grant that will increase our system so that we can make a better vital records or better surveillance system. It's really, we have the surveillance system. It's good enough. We need to keep going and use that surveillance system to do population health. Um, there's also this advanced epidemiology statistics and methodology section. So certain departments have really great staff. A lot of departments, at the, especially the county and city, don't have staff that do anything with the data. They collect it. They have access to great levels of data. They can tell you the gender and maybe age, and that's about it. They don't do odds ratios. They don't do anything like that. It's really because they don't have, A, the time, and B, the resources or the tools to do these things. So what is the role of a public health department in health systems integration? Um, again, we're really good at identification of a problem. So we can make these observations, take the data, and look and see what it does. Um, they're also good at gathering the system. So who has these resources and how do we contact them? The problem has been we identify who has them, we identify the populations, but we don't reach across the aisle and say, hey, this population that you serve with these three hospitals has this issue. How do we go about solving it? Um, and it's become more of a thing now, especially with uh, immunizations, of a health plan provider wants to set up an immunization clinic. 
They have the resources, they have the funding. What they don't know is how to set up an actual clinic. How do you get people there? How do you tell people? You know, what methods are best? Public health, while we don't have the resources to do these clinics, we know how to get people there. We know who to contact. We know where the vaccine hesitant populations are that we can offer these free vaccines to and what the best return will be. Um, the linkage of systems. It's something that everyone's struggling with now that we're trying to do more integration and get away from these data silos. Um, so there's great resources out there like CDC Wonder. Most people have never looked at CDC Wonder, but it has great population data on things like cancer. Um, and it gets really refined as to how far it goes. Most people know NHANES, and that's the CDC data set. But there's so much more in the CDC, it's just that no one's advertising this. And partly it's because they don't have the resources to do it. So you get these pockets of, why well, did research research with this and we use this data set and then it kind of spreads through that chain but it usually stops. There needs to be, um, as one of the students actually pointed out in a meeting we had earlier of how do you create a wiki tool that says this is the information that's out there, this is the free to access information and this is approaches that you know have worked in studies that have been founded using these kinds of resources. Um, there's also this need again for creation of an integrated system and what are we missing? So as you move up this paradigm of observation to data, to information, to knowledge, to actionable items, which is the public health action, you get to this wisdom of what did we completely miss when we did this? Um, so a great example is with STDs. Everyone pushed for increased screening. And it stopped before it hit the, well, we really also, when people come in and screen positive, we need to do contact tracing for them. So who's in their sexual network and how do you define a sexual network? I'm getting providers to ask their patients who might be married and Jim comes in with syphilis and you never see Helen come in with syphilis. So how do you talk to Jim and say, hey, who are you having sex with? Where are you having sex? What's your sexual network? And it's a big problem, but it needs to happen in order to reduce disease in the population. So again, the integration projects, and this is a little health information exchange slide that I came across. Um, it's really how do you connect these health systems, so medical practices, Consumers, they're part of the health system. Um, hospitals, public health labs, clinic labs, pharmacies, and public health as in public health departments. Um, the ideal go at, goal at the end of this is a nationwide health information exchange. Um, states can't even do it. Cities can't even do it. There are certain cities that have five to six. New York has a whole lot more of these little data silos that are health information exchanges, but they exist in one healthcare setting. So a certain hospital group has their own health information exchange. It's really great, but the five other healthcare settings that also share the same population never see their data. And so at the end of the day, it becomes, this was a really great tool, but everyone figured out that their data is so much more important and no one wants to share it. So the first one is the Quit Tobacco Incentive Program. So where we started with this, it started between Lane County Prevention, Trillium, which is the local CCO, and providers and clinics, with providers and clinics being the per people doing recruitment, um, screening, they were going to hand out incentives, and they were going to do the counseling, all within a clinical visit. Um, we also had some help with recruitment from the Oregon Quit Line. What happened the first year? Terrible enrollment. So physicians were, of course, asking pregnant mothers, do you smoke? And they were, of course, saying, you shouldn't smoke, and here's some information. What they weren't doing is going through the 45-minute enrollment form to enroll them in this project. Um, they were just taking it into their own hands because they had to get through, and they didn't want to push something that the mother might not like and then lose that mother and that those prenatal visits because they're so important. Um, so they felt overburdened. What didn't help was the tobacco assessment tool, which was a uh, coding test, didn't work at all. So a mother would come in, says she smokes, smells of tobacco smoke, do the test, come back fine, and they could technically give her the incentive. Um, another mother says she doesn't smoke, doesn't smell like smoke, but she doesn't pass the coping test, and now they have to tell this mother, you don't get this incentive, and it was a monetary incentive. Um, and so it put the stress on the physicians that they didn't want to have of creating a bad relationship with their patient. Um, so it caused a large amount of friction between the project staff and the study, er, and the clinical providers and staff. Study staff said, you need to be doing this. And providers said, we feel that we're risking our patient's relationship with us when we do this. 
Um, and, for, and again, providers were placed in, in the situation of having to tell a pregnant woman that they didn't qualify for the incentive even after the woman said, no, I cut back. She doesn't smell like tobacco smoke, things like that. Um, what data was missing? So we had low enrollment, we had really poor data, um, but what we found was we didn't know who gave birth, when they gave birth, until months afterwards when the claim data came back in. And then we didn't know how to link those children. So we were trying to measure these outcomes of the child's birth, like birth weight. We had no idea then how to link these children back up. Um, and there was really a limited data infrastructure. So all these clinics were recruiting. They had paper copies. They were faxing over the paper copies. There was no one checking to say, okay, you, you recruited this many people today based on the number of things we got. Um, the paper copies had transcription errors when they were put into Excel spreadsheets. Um, and there were multiple people enrolling women who didn't really have a standardized approach to enrolling them. So what happened in year two is we moved it to WIC. We called it something else and we stopped using the coding test. Uh, we changed it to carbon monoxide testing and we reevaluated the data collection tool. And we developed an access database and we had one person doing the work that all these other providers were doing. They were enrolling. They were a trained counselor. Um, so they could enroll someone and give them counseling on day one. It wasn't, well, you need to make another appointment so we can assess your tobacco. They were doing it right away. And it opened up communication between the CCO, WIC, and Lane County Prevention, which didn't exist before this. It also allowed us to have a more reliable tobacco measurement tool. So when your whole study, your whole program is hinged on can you detect if someone uses tobacco, and you have a tool that doesn't allow you to do that, your study is kind of in a lot of trouble. Um, so we could determine now who is and who isn't smoking. We can actually determine who comes back and is flagged as a secondhand smoker so that we can say, okay, you quit, but we understand that you live with someone who still continues to smoke. Here's your incentive for at least you quitting, at least taking the first steps on this row. Um, we were able, with WIC, to collect the baby's name. So in WIC, the mother was tied to the baby. It's a whole family structure. And so now we're not losing these people. We can say, we know very short order when they were born, where they were born, what their name is at birth, and when they come to the WIC appointments, that counselor actually gets to see that baby and make sure that they didn't change the name, that they're not living someplace else and we lose them, we get a loss of follow-up. Um, we're also to track uh, things on e-cigarettes. So we found that a lot of these mothers were quitting smoking. They were replacing with e-cigarettes. Um, not the ideal solution for us, kind of an unintended consequence, but at least now we can track that. We can say, these people quit smoking, went to e-cigarettes, what are their birth outcomes? Are they different or are they the same? Um, we also were collecting data on the counseling type. Now it's one person doing the counseling. So we know what the counseling type is. We know it's the five A's that we have been pushing for. We know what they're doing. We also know how many times they're coming in for counseling and how many times they're calling in for counseling. So that pushes us to the second project, which is the five A's. So it was a proven tobacco intervention method. And it was ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. Um, we wanted to use an EHR um, to collect this data. And it needed to work seamlessly, which is the key word that everyone wants to hear when they work with NextGen or another EHR is seamlessly integrated. Um, and they thought they were going to do this using a template. Um, so the stakeholders became Lane County Prevention, who was in charge of tobacco. The CHCs, which is who we're trying to push this template on. Um, Trillium, who was kind of helping fund and essentially appointing people to be the pilots for these people. The Uniform Data System Analyst, who said, you can't touch these templates. We need them to report so that we get money back. So there's no way you can change a template, even if it doesn't work, and even if the only thing we're collecting on a four-page document is do you smoke and how much do you smoke? Because that's what we're looking for. Um, and then that came into Lane's, Lane County's next-gen staff, which we found out they didn't know how to edit a template, and they were told specifically by next-gen, don't ever do it. So the current next-gen user interface was not designed for a clinical flow. Physicians decided they weren't going to use it and went to, nat or went to free text fields. So we got this jumble without a natural language processor to come out so that we could say, what are these numbers? Um, so now we have people who are having to go back and audit the system and say, who's using tobacco, which we didn't catch in this tool that is essentially broken, but no one wants to change because no one wants to break it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Very frustrating. Um, so we needed to make a usable template. We found out that actually what we needed was a document and getting people 
people's biggest problem was they couldn't just print out a document that said, at the end of the day, what they did with this patient, um, even though it was all housed in the actual tobacco cessation template. Um, so there was this incentivized measure that we had to get around, and the workflow, the work had to flow so the clinicians wanted to use it. Um, and it's still something we're struggling on because they don't even want us to rearrange it to make it flow better. Um, so the barriers to progress. No one wants to risk breaking a template even if no one's using that template. Um, it really was this roadblock of, it doesn't work, when it works for some people, so we're just going to keep it. Um, the good part of the data is we knew tobacco, we knew smoking st status and tobacco use. That was it, though. We didn't know what medication, we didn't know how many attempts they were using. We couldn't calculate who was doing this five A's, which is a pretty simple thing of, did you ask about them wanting to quit, because you should ask everyone, and then documented it. They weren't using that, they were using a free text field. And a large majority of them were using it, but we couldn't see it and no one was giving them credit, and people were calling them up and saying, you need to start using this, and that made a already tense physician public health relationship even more tense. Um, the ugly was, it was difficult, difficult to pull the patient notes in a meaningful way. You got stuck with these whole paragraphs that you were trying to find, did these people smoke, and where they offered counseling. Um, and it caused a lot of resource. But at the end of the day, no one wants to change it. So how can we get better data out of it? So limited to poor data currently on the number of variables. So if we can get people to start filling out secession tobacco history and then giving them a report that allows them to see that they can actually do it, it's going to help. Um, so any stage of this will help. So getting a physician to say, all I care about is at the end of the day, I can give them a sheet that says, this is what I got out of your tobacco history, does help, and it's getting a little bit of a buy-in. Um, and that helps with tracking interventions, and we're hoping to bring in at least two federally qualified health centers on board with this. But it's been an uphill battle. Um, the third one, which I'm going to breeze over to get to the STD one, uh, is Im immunization registry. There's a great immunization registry that is run by the state, and everyone uses it to check whether or not their patient is immunized. After they immunize a patient, they don't put in that they were immunized. So we had people calling about a measles outbreak in Lane County. <coughs> One lady said that she'd been immunized for MMR as an adult about four times. You look at her record, no record of it. That's why she was immunized four times, even though you know people would suggest two times. So it was really hard to tell her, no, you're fine. It's just that we have no record of it. And the next time they want to give you a booster, you can go ahead and skip that booster. <laughs> but it's a waste of resource at the end of the day. They're using it because they want to know if the person needs the vaccine. They're just not recording that they actually gave that person the vaccine. So the next time another provider sees them, they're giving them the same vaccine. Um, so we needed all providers to report. And that was the biggest thing is finding these providers and saying, why aren't you reporting? And it came down to it was difficult for them because their EHR didn't feed directly into the alert. Um, they didn't know how to fix that. We as public health did and said, okay, these are the issues we need to bring up to the state because they want to make this program work and they're willing to put in templates so that your next-gen system can feed directly into it. Um, so it's, hopefully it's going to give us better data. We at least have people acknowledging that they're not recording it um, and at least giving us the paper copy so that we can record it at the health department. The big one is STD reduction. Um, since 2010, there's been an increase in the county as well as the state. Um, and we have this excellent data collection tool called Orpheus. And it's the Oregon Public Health Epi User System. And it's all reportable diseases. And it gives you the co-infection status. It gives you their concurrent status of, did they have Giardia when they had Chlamydia? Um, random, but it's helpful because it tells you that, you know, someone who has Chlamydia where it's also co-infected with gonorrhea as opposed to going through these separate data silos and taking everyone who has Chlamydia and trying to match them with everyone who has gonorrhea who has HIV. Um, so we were able to do it with just one tool, but no one knew how to use that tool. So Lane County decided that we needed a three-year strategic plan um, that really revolved around data and looking at the data and then setting up an STD coalition in the county. Um, so what we found is we only have data on positive cases. I can't tell you the positivity rate that Planned Parenthood has. I can't tell you the positivity rate that a provider has. I can tell you how many patients they have and where we think the burden of the disease is, 
but it really comes down to how many of their patients are they actually seeing, and where does the contact of those patients go? So we have all these fragmented systems of, you know, someone goes to Planned Parenthood, but their partner goes someplace else, and that whole contact link is lost. Um, so how do you do it? And we found that we have 45 to 90 percent missing risk factor data. So down to how many sexual partners do you have? Do you engage in anonymous sex? We don't have that data. We have what's your gender, where do you live, and how old are you? Uh, so it's really hard to say this is the population at risk for gonorrhea other than, well, it's 25 to 34-year-old male and female. That's a pretty blanketed statement. Um, it doesn't really help anyone to make meaningful outcomes and meaningful um, public health projects out of it. So what we were trying to do with integration was who's all affected by STDs in Lane County, and how do you get them to the table so that I know what Planned Parenthood's population is, I know who they see, and more importantly, I know who they know that they're missing. What it came down to is we tried to bring in as many people as we could, um, but we wanted to keep it small enough, and it actually grew organically, which may or may not be great. Email me Wednesday, and I'll be able to tell you how it went Tuesday when we had the coalition meeting, mm -hmm. which went from 12 people to about 20 to 30 people. Um, but we were able to get ID docs, we were able to get OBGYNs who were seeing chlamydia and gonorrhea in their pregnant population and are very concerned about it. They're a very small fraction, but they know how serious it can be, and they wonder about how many people they're actually missing. Um, Planned Parenthood and uh, U of O's down here, they're, they're part of the coalition too. Um, we had to include them because they're part of Lane County. Um, so it ended with thinking past health systems. So adult bookstores are a place where people engage in anonymous sex. We only knew that because our nurses were asking people, was there any place that you actually engage in anonymous sex? And what we found is there is a bookstore that everyone was going to and getting disease. We wouldn't have known that because there's no place in any data tracking system that says, hey, is there a place you go to for anonymous sex? Um, when we looked at the literature and found that Seattle had went to uh, sites like Grindr and Manhunt and actually got them to agree to allow them to post ads for free condoms, for STD prevention, telling people on those sites where you can go to get tested and giving them a price tag that said, this is what it costs if you don't have thing, or don't have insurance. This is what we ask that you donate for your treatment. Um, but also looking at bars, nightclubs, college dorms, hookup apps, social media. So the health departments typically are made up of folks that don't use a lot of social media. Um, they're not going to be heavily tied into the college campus. And so getting interns, though, that use Twitter and use it effectively, not having someone like me, who I've never used Twitter, try and tweet about where to get STD <laughs> services, it's not going to work. I, I don't have any followers on Twitter. <laughs> I usually try and win contests. Um, so it's not going to work for me. Um, and the county jail. So we know that a large percent of their population has disease. They go in, but the county was only con only wanted to treat what was present when they came in. So if they were injured, they treat that. They weren't doing an STD screening test on everyone that came in. But they recognize it as an issue, and they want to come on board with, if they can do it, who do they then farm these people who are in for a night off to? And how do we not then lose them after we treat them, or after we screen them? So better data. We need contacts. We need to know what orifice they use during sex. So there's people who we screen using their urine for gonorrhea and chlamydia who don't ever have sexual contact through their genitals. It's through their mouth and through their anus. That's just how they engage in sex, but we're only screening them one way. And we need the data that says, if we go through and do pharyngeal swabs, so throat swabs on people, what's the positivity rate and who should we even be giving those swabs to? Um, for the county, it's an issue of cost, but we also know that we're gonna miss people who don't have you know, um, vaginal chlamydia. They have it in their throat. Um, so what the gender of sexual partners is. You think that would be an easy thing to capture? We're just not capturing it. Is it because people aren't asking? That's what we think. So how do we change that? Well, we get this coalition together and we say, you need to change it. Um, EPT usage, so giving <coughs> expedited partner therapy so their partner doesn't have to come in. Um, it's huge and it's really underutilized. Oregon State Law says that we can use it for gonorrhea. CDC said, hey, we're worried about uh, multi-drug resistant gonorrhea, lay off of it. There really isn't multi-drug resistant <coughs> gonorrhea in Oregon 
So it's something that we need to look at as a tool as gonorrhea rates rise. So do we want to attempt this because we know it's proven to be effective. But with chlamydia, where there's none of this concern, people still aren't using it. And we have no way to track of who gave it out and did they actually, did you give it out to someone? Did they actually fill it? Because that's the only way we can know that they actually tried to do anything with it. No one's tracking this data. We need to start. <coughs> so then we don't know number of repeat infections because we only know of reportable diseases. Um, so we want to try and increase screening so that if someone's asymptomatic, we can treat them so they're not spreading it, thinking that they're clean and ready to go. The last one, which is very brief, is lethal <coughs> means prevention. So really, this is blocking access to ways to harm yourself. So if someone's suicidal, they come to the doctor, they say they have suicidal thoughts. Um, there's nothing that the doctor then gives them to say, hey, these are all the gun lockers in Lane County. This is how you go and you talk to your friends and family to say, maybe you should take my guns away for a little bit of time. Um, there's none of these structures set up. And what we're trying to do is implement them in the HR. Yes, if they're suicidal, they're going to find a way. But let's try and take as many ways away as we can while they're still talking to people and saying, hey, I'm having these thoughts, and I'm concerned that I might hurt myself. But it all comes back to we have to make a next-gen template, and we know from other projects that this is difficult. But it's building this bridge of we at least know that. We know that this, while it looks like an overnight thing, isn't going to be an overnight thing. So how do we start to build this bridge with people who know next-gen who can build us templates? Um, we also want to pilot in the CHCs. Now we had some friction with some of the other projects. So how do you go and repair that friction and say, we know this maternal smoking project didn't work. We know it caused stress. We don't want to repeat that. We want to create this relationship where we can go and say, we have another pilot project. It's a lot better thought out. These are how we're going to implement it. So where do we need to be? Health information exchange. At the end of the day, that's where we want to be with health system integration, is we want a health information exchange where we can go and say, this is the population, and these are the actual problems that they have, not just reportable diseases, not just the easy ones like obesity through their driver's license, which not that great, even though it works, we can actually then get medical records and say, this is the obesity population, this is how it scales out in the population. Um, communicating the data that we see. Lane County, we're terrible at it. Our ID docs and everyone who's involved in STDs should know the current state of STDs in the county, and they don't. And that's part of this coalition is, we have this data we're sitting on, People need to know that these are the issues. They need to know that HIV, not a huge issue in Lane County. Gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia, they are. And this is what we need to be doing to prevent them. And that MSMs aren't the huge issue in Lane County. It's heterosexuals. And there's no great community base for how do you get heterosexual men in a group and who's their group leader. There really is no structure like that. How do you go about changing this kind of paradigm? Um, we need to learn from each other to make communities that we serve healthier. So some places are really good with managing diabetic patients. They need to share that data with everyone else so we can make the overall community healthier. Um, and then maintaining systems that are a benefit. So instead of always having to go back to Vital Records and say, we need this, having a system set up after the first time that says, we can do this now, we can give this information. Now it comes down to better data, clinical data, better risk factor data, better contact data, better data on who's using the current recommended treatment and diagnosis protocol, um, what are the number of repeat infections, not just reportable, but when we screen people, how many asymptomatic people are there? Um, what's the social environment? So for obesity, what does it look like for the retail outlet around them? Um, for smoking-related diseases, what's the per capita of smoking retail establishments in that area. Um, and it all comes down to the health of the population, trying to get better data on those individuals. Um, so many thanks to my mentors, uh, Dr. Lucky and Patrice Korjenik, uh, Jennifer Webster, who runs most of these projects before I came in. Um, these are our funders. NACHO is not just a fancy word for nachos. Uh, it is the National Association of City and County Health Organizations. Um, PHII is the Public Health Informatics Institute. Um, these are people at Trillium. And then Project Shine is what I'm a part of and my fellowships through. And then Lane County. Uh, 
and Project Shine is strengthening health systems through interprofessional education, and we have to add these two slides at the end. Um, that's it. Any questions? So it's a writing metadata for national security. In this age of hackers, I wouldn't like my data to end up in North Korea. Okay. So for how much amount of integration would you need in order not to create a like, smoothing like panic integration? Right. So that is one of the big barriers for integration is how do you keep the data secure um, so it doesn't end up in um, the wrong hands. I don't know that we're there yet with having a solution for it. We do know that having all these data silos, though, isn't really helping anyone. And the security that's based on those silos isn't uniform. So people could be getting that data out, and we're not even knowing it. And the theory is, as you start to merge data together and see what the actual appropriate level of security is, you can fill in those gaps of where the security lacks. And yes, it, it paints a bigger target a lot of times. Um, but what Indiana found was, when they started, so they have one of the first health information exchanges, and it, it's very robust and it's actually very uniform as compared to how fractured a lot of these other places are. They haven't been seeing data breaches. They haven't been seeing anything because everyone's looking at their data system. Everyone knows if there was a data breach, and everyone knows where there might be gaps. Um, so it kind of actually has strength in their security. Um, whether or not that pans out when, you know, my ideal goal, and I would love to be a part of the project with the national one, yeah, it's going to be difficult, and the security on that is going to be incredibly intense. Um, but at the same time, where are we at when two hospitals who are right next door to each other can't exchange any health information? Um, yeah, it would be terrible that someone else got that data, but now no one has that data, <coughs> and the population isn't getting any healthier because of it. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much.